This is Ralph from Happy Dog Training and welcome to another episode of Dog Talk. Today we're going to talk about spaying and neutering of dogs. Now, obviously that's an important topic and it's very common practice to do so in the United States. Um, my personal views on spaying and neutering have definitely changed over the years. I started off on one side of the spectrum and now I'm on the complete opposite side for a lot of reasons. And I want to go over today what I recommend and why. So in terms of spaying and neutering, it's really common practice. So if you go to any veterinarian, have a new puppy checkup, they immediately bring it up, spay and neuter your dog. You can't even rescue a dog from a shelter without it being fixed, spayed or neutered. And it's just what we do around here. Now, that's not the same everywhere on earth. So there's other countries who have very different rules. So there's, uh, in Germany, for example, you're not allowed to just do that. So you can't go alter dogs unless there is a medical reason to do so. There's other things you can do to achieve sterility, and we're going to get to those because you can do those also here. They're just not common. But you can't do these things that we have just become to accept. Oh, yeah, to spay and neuter. That's just what you do. So when I was a young dog trainer or yeah, I wasn't that young anymore when I started training dogs, but like 18 years ago, 15 years ago or so. I was on the bandwagon of you should spay and neuter your dogs and probably do it before they hit eight months or so, so you kind of avoid behavioral problems maybe down the line. Um, I believe that that is still what is postulated quite a bit these days, even by a lot of veterinarians still. But at what cost are we doing that? And is that really a good idea? Is it necessary? And do you actually get the health benefits? Or are there downsides? So in 2013, there was a study conducted at UC Davis in California on the effects, long-term effects, of spaying and neutering in golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers. What the researchers did in this study, and it's important to understand what they did because it's not that they monitored dogs over their entire lifetime, but what they did is they went to a whole bunch of veterinarians and they pulled veterinary records from, I think it was uh, somewhat 11,000 or 13, not 11,000, 1,100 or 1,300 dogs or something like that. So over 1,000 dogs for sure. And what they did is they looked at when was this animal sterilized, spayed or neutered, and what health conditions developed later in life. And they looked at different stages of spaying and neutering and compared. So that's important to understand because obviously that is not 100% conclusive in every aspect. There's, there would be cleaner ways of per se doing that, but they would cost a fortune and probably never happen. So it is a decent approximation in terms of how they approached it. But there are some other factors that probably could not be isolated in, in this approach. However, what they found over several dog breeds, which also makes that interesting, is the following. So in the uh, first study in 2013 amongst golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers, if the spaying or neutering occurred before six months of age, so a fairly young dog, so before six months, there was a four to five hundred percent. I mean, this, this is a high number, right? Four to five hundred percent increase in joint diseases later in life. Hip dysplasia and things like that. Joint, other joint issues. Four to five hundred percent that they didn't see when the dog was spayed after six months. Over 1,100 some dogs, that is a substantial or significant indication that there is an issue with that. And that also makes sense because in spaying and neutering, what happens is they take out the endocrine system, which is the most important part of the hormonal system. And that impacts growth, impacts development, impacts all kinds of things. It's part of the immune system. So it's just not per se a good idea to remove these kinds of organs. And there's a clearly health impact. So the other thing they saw was, particularly in the female population, if the spaying happened after six months, and that's particularly the, the female golden retrievers, 
um, there was a still 300 to 400 percent increase in cancer. I mean, that's really serious, right? So in golden females, if you spay them after six months, you get the cancer rate to go up three to 400 percent. So basically, if you have a golden female retriever, don't even think about spaying. That's basically what it comes down to. They didn't see this increase with the female Labradors. And there was another study done with golden retriever, uh, with German shepherds in 2015 that had very similar findings, but also did not have the increased cancer risk that we saw in goldens. But the uh, three to four hundred percent, four to five hundred percent increase in joint diseases in German shepherds also held up. The numbers were slightly different, but overall the trend was the same. And this is now three different dog breeds that didn't test other breeds, but three different dog breeds having very similar results is an indication there is something there we should probably be concerned about in that regard. Now, the other thing they found was in the spaying and neutering with the female population overall, increased risk in um, urinary tract infections and incontinence, even with spaying after six months. So there is a risk associated with spaying and neutering in general, and more so than spaying than neutering per se. But um, these studies are on the UC Davis website. They're also on our website on an article that um, is a companion article to this podcast. Uh, my thoughts on spaying and neutering it was written in 2018, so it's now five years old. But these are studies are from even before that, so from 2013 and 15. Now, with older veterinarians, there's still this tendency to want to recommend to spay and neuter fairly early. With younger veterinarians who came out of vet school not that long ago, that has kind of changed. So the knowledge is starting to propagate through it. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Right? So if it comes down straightly to a health perspective, probably not the greatest of ideas to spay and neuter dogs. Now you may say, well, hold on a second. There's this overpopulation. We have all these dogs in shelters, and there's a lot of dogs that get euthanized because we have so many strays, and there's so many issues that we have aside of that. And that is certainly true. Let's get into that a little bit. Now, so I was just talking about the health up to this point. So just from this, strictly speaking from a health perspective, if you're not concerned about um, overpopulation, if you're not concerned about having accidents, accidental litters, or things like that, spaying and neutering should maybe not be on your priority list. Now, outside of the health perspective, there's obviously other concerns. So I mentioned a couple already, but... The personal impact on you will be, for example, if you do not do that, uh, you're going to get nasty comments from people because everybody believes that should be done. Well, it's not really the case, but people have this belief that this is what you should be doing. So people will comment on your dog with a male, with a female they can't see, but with a male they'll, they'll comment. Um, you will not be able to go to dog parks. There's, there's more, more rules that you can't go to dog parks if the dog isn't fixed. Um, you may not be able to go to daycare. You may not be able to get a dog walker. You may not be able to get to grooming, uh, boarding. There may, may be restrictions that you will have because of a lack of education amongst other people that you're going to interact with as a pet owner. But then again, there's also the effect that other dogs may react to your dog in a different way because they're not sterilized. And that is not untrue. So there is certainly can be a reaction from other dogs not necessarily bad, but more interest or more persistence or more bullying. There could be things that could happen that come with that, that with proper training and so aren't really issues, but in the general population with boarding, and uh, it could be a problem. So a lot of the boarding places and uh, daycare places and even grooming sometimes, they just don't even allow dogs to come in that are not spayed or neutered. From their perspective, makes sense. Uh, overall, does it generally make sense? Not really. But from a perspective of those businesses, it makes total sense because it makes their life easier, reduces risk. So it's totally fair for those businesses to take that position because they have to march that more. And so I, I get that. I'm not criticizing businesses for making that choice. That is, it's a fair business decision if you're running a, a boarding place or a daycare place or something like that. But it's just something to consider as a pet owner that you may be restricted. So when I... I board dogs for my own clients, people I work with, I don't really care. I mean, I recently had a dog that was actually in heat even. It's fine too. I, I know the dogs. I've worked with them. I, I board dogs. 
<laughs> I bought all kinds of dogs. For, for my own clients, I bought dogs. I don't do it anymore for like everybody, but for people I've worked with dogs, I've trained dogs, I know it. Like, I, I, it's like, come to me, I'll board them, no problem. <laughs> it's like, I don't charge more than the other places. I'm actually a little bit cheaper sometimes um, for, for long-standing clients that have been with me for a long time. But anyways, so there will be an impact on you. So there is that. Now, the main thing, though, that every pet owner has to be concerned with, and you have to watch it if your dog isn't fixed, is you could have accidents, right? It doesn't take long for dogs to get together and have accidents. So if you have a female in heat, if you have a female, you have to really watch it. You don't want to be the one ending up with the puppies. Right? With a male, well, you can get in trouble if your male gets with a female and they find out it was yours. Uh, so you don't want any of that to happen. These are not good things. I'm not trying to make light of that, but these are the situations that you may run into. So sterility is something you may want to, you may care about, and that's why you may want to go spare and neuter. However, if it's just about sterility, there are better options. So as I said earlier, in other countries, you can't just go and rip out the entire hormonal system. The endocrine system can't just be removed. But that doesn't mean you cannot achieve sterility. So the things you do in humans, tie the tubes, cut the cord, right? So vasectomies, you can absolutely do those in dogs. So you can get a vasectomy for your male dog, or you can get what's called an ovarian sparring spay. The ovaries are spared, they're not taken out, so ovarian sparring spay. And they're just Tie the tubes, just like they would in a human female, basically. And that, that's, a, that's a general approach they would take. And that's absolutely possible. Those surgeries will cost a couple of hundred dollars more, but they're not exorbitantly expensive. So let's say you're looking with your dog weight, can you use goes by weight class and sedation costs. So let's say your spay and noodle cost would be three, four hundred dollars. An ovarian sparring spay may run you six, seven hundred dollars, something like that. So it's, it's not like crazy expensive, but it will cost more. So it's certainly not everybody will be able to just easily afford it. I get that. But it's not exorbitantly expensive either. Now, the thing you need, though, and this is why it costs more, you need a board-certified veterinarian. Now, you may think every veterinarian should be board-certified, but that's not the case. So most veterinarians are actually not. Um, I think like 90% of veterinarians are not board certified. It's something like that. It's a high number. So the majority is not board certified. Maybe that changes one day or the procedures change. But so board certified veterinarians are the minority. But those are the veterinarians that are better trained. They can perform other types of surgeries. You would also find board certified veterinarians often at like specialty clinics for spinal surgery and stuff like that in pets. I had, I had a dog once that went through spinal surgery. These are definitely very different type of veterinarians than the vet around the corner. These are specialists. Also. But board certified veterinarians can perform this sur surgery. So you may wonder, well, how do I find one of those? Actually, very simple. There is a website called the uh, Parsimos Foundation, Parsimos Foundation. And on that website, you can search in your area by zip code, where is the nearest by board certified veterinarian you can look them up and you can see what the services they offer and the board certified vets um, it's very few who don't offer the um, the, um, the vasectomies and the ovarian sparring space actually I think all of them do that I've looked at I looked in California Southern California my area I looked it up for a client recently and I have a link to that on the website I'm going to put that link also in the show notes of this but it also in the companion article my thoughts on spaying and neutering it's at the bottom so what I'm going to put in the show notes are links to the studies that I mentioned, the 2013 studies, the long-term health effects in the comparative studies between golden retrievers and Labradors. I'm going to put a link to the 2015 studies of spaying and neutering effects of German shepherds. And I'll put a link to the Parsimus Foundation and obviously to the companion article where you can read a little bit more detailed on some of the things that I went over in this podcast. So that's it on spaying and neutering. That is the general information. So um, consider all aspects, all angles of it for you, what is important to you. So there are certainly other, effects, uh, other aspects to that than um, just the main one, which is, is this the best thing for my dog? But when it comes down to female goldens, I think you just have to um, tell yourself this is the best thing because you're increasing the cancer risk quite a bit. And 
you should probably not do that. So a female golden retriever, I would highly recommend ovarian sparring spay and nothing else and just leave it at that. And uh, if that's not something you want to do, probably not fair to have a female golden at this point, given the, the extreme re risk increase in uh, joint diseases and cancer risk. So the female goldens really have the short end of the stick from the three breeds that have been looked at so far. Maybe we'll get more data on other breeds in the future. It would be very interesting. There's definitely a trend line here to see if that holds up with other breeds. There's no indication that it wouldn't at this point. So I would, um, I would consider it as a good recommendation to do uh, use vasectomies in ovarian sparring space on all breeds at this point and not spay and neuter anymore. But that is an assumption based on reading the study. So I would read you, I would encourage you to actually read them. They're not long, they're pretty easy to read. And there's a couple of write-ups also on UC Davis website on them to explain them in more detail. So it's actually very accessible. It's very easy to understand. It's not too technical in, in the way the whole thing is presented. But it's good information. It's good to understand and understand that younger vets will know it and older vets may not even, may not be aware. They're generally, they're lit, uh, literally may not be aware of this information. So um, this is one of the things I mentioned in another podcast, I think. There is so much information all the time. There are so many studies done all the time on medical advances, surgical procedures. Um, you have it. And we're not talking about training studies now. We're talking about purely medical studies on how to take care of this, how to take care of that, how to uh, do this surgery, address this problem. And veterinarians, we, we think of our pets, but they have to deal with a broad range of species. I mean, people don't just bring cats and dogs to vets. Right? They bring birds of all kinds. They bring snakes. They bring reptiles. They bring spiders. They bring mice and gerbils. I mean, they bring rats. They bring all kinds of things to the vet. So a veterinarian needs to be well-versed in all kinds of animals. And it's a lot of information to keep up with. So if veterinarians are unable, they're busy, they have a big practice, they're Right, it's running well, it's a good business, good for them. Right? But it makes it very difficult for even the best intentioned and most well-meaning veterinarian to stay on top of it the whole time. So we have to be fair and acknowledge that and be fair in that regard. So I don't blame them if they can't, can't do that all the time. That's a big one, but still, it doesn't matter. It's, just, it's a mountain of, of, of things they have to look at all the time. And they probably have email lists set up where they get the study sent to them and so. But it's still a lot to read, you know, if you're dealing with like 20 different main species of animals that people drag into your office on a regular basis. Good luck keeping up and all of that after a work day. So it's, it's tricky. We have to acknowledge that. But that's why it's good to be informed as a dog owner and ask for the right things and maybe just based on reading some things, make your own decision, just pick the right vet from the get-go so don't even bother um, with someone who can't do what you actually want to do. So if you want to go down the vasectomy um, or various sparring spay route, the Parsimus Foundation will guide you straight up through vets who can do that. So you spay yourself a go around and having a discussion that ultimately you don't need if that's what you want to do. And I recommend you strongly consider doing it if you can. Okay, that was a little shorter today. And about this important topic, and this is the, the, the key findings I wanted to share with you. I hope that was helpful. You got something out of it, and I'll see you next time. Bye.